not be interested or, or that psychology will not be interested in building up that marriage and she will not be interested in teaching the patient for forgiveness or anything of reconciliation of any kind. She will only talk to this patient to be happy, to find happiness, to find freedom in life. So everything that is an obstacle in your life, you should get ready of because that is the calling of new age. New age is about glorifying yourself. It's about building up yourself. It's about finding your own freedom and your own way of doing things. Thus, that independence is exactly the flag of new age, independence. And the more we look at it, the more we find so many sources of new age. Imagine that ecology, most of the ecological movements of today are new age. You notice that sometimes all of these ecologist movements come to a country in the third world. Let's say I just found uh, something really bad in Argentina. They have beautiful place, places there on the Pacific side, way down south, close to the Patagonia. And then these institutions that are just big time corporations, they came down and, and made sure that the UN declare a whole area as a, as, as a humanities patrimony, you know, like something that belongs to humanity. I forgot the terms they use, but anyways, they took over all of the land and no one can touch it. See, there are areas of there, there that are precious and it's right that they don't let anybody build anything there and should conserve, preserve them like that. But there are hundreds of miles hundreds of miles that there's nothing special there and they are not to be touched. Then why is this happening? Because what they're doing, the superpowers, uh, what they're doing, they're preserving those lands for the future of their countries, the future of the power. They don't let people consume the, res the natural reserves that are there. See, and they're taking over big pieces of land for their own benefit. And those are big corporations that come around and take over. See, they, nobody sold them that. Nobody offered it to them. But they come in as a big world organization and say, all this land should be preserved because it belongs to humanity. And, and then if the governments fight against that, that means you are going against what belongs to humanity. And then you are not aware and concerned about ecology. You are not to protect the planet. So you, you, you have these big important nations going around the world preaching about the global warming and also preaching about how overpopulated Earth is. You know, that couldn't be, uh, that has to be the biggest lie ever. Any one of you that has, has traveled and cross the oceans and cross many places on earth, you know that there is so much land untouched on earth that is rich with all kinds of natural reserves all around the world. Nobody could ever fool us telling us the world is overpopulated. What is overpopulated is the cities. You see, the cities are overpopulated because you know, these systems, these economical systems and, 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 and private powers, they brought people, in, masses of people into the cities and keeps them, keeps them in debt. You see, they have debts that last 30 years, 40 years to pay a home. To, they, are, they are engaged in horrible debts for years. They are not able to go anywhere. If they go anywhere, they lose everything they have. They have to work there. And apparently, that's beneficial. Because you can say if they don't do that, they will be hungry somewhere. They will not be able to survive. That's not necessarily the truth. But part of the New Age movement is the globalization. See, one day we end up with one world order, one world currency, and then we will not have a religion. See, there is a man in the U.S. called Ted Turner that was the one that um, came up with CNN News. He sold that to Warner Brothers, half of it, and then when he made that deal, that were billions of dollars, he donated $2 billion to the UN. And he's a mason, right? 
The condition of those two billion dollars, it's a gigantic donation, is that they will put together a world church. So what they're doing is for the year 2015, we are going to have a world church. A church with no Bible, no doctrine, a church with no God, a church of people. So what they're going to do is in every capital of the world, of every country, is going to have that church and is going to be connected, you know, and through the web. And then every Sunday they're going to have a service and it's going to be connected worldwide. So those that join the church are going to be benefited with jobs and they're going to have amazing works of charity, feeding the poor, bringing housing to the poor, and doing great works of, 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 of social work. And then everyone that joins becomes part of that power. And then they're going to prove that the origin of all wars and the origin of all misery on earth is religions. See? So that's the way they take religion out of the heart of society. And, they, and that's part of new age. There's so much new age going on because of the times. And what is the reason, why, what is the reason for this? You see, the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, the tougher the battle. And the devil is going to come up with more and more sophisticated ways of enslaving us. You know, the world has never been more enchanting than today, more seducing. And Satan has all the toys out, all the cards on the table, because he's a gambler. And he's putting it all out to, to get us so busy that we are 24 hours a day focus on this earthly life and that way he steals from us the graces of eternal life and that's what he's doing so therefore all this movement of new age what they do is they focus people on temporary powers and on temporary benefits because if you know why people go to a witch why do they have car reading palm reading a spiritualist and talking to spirits and all of these numerologies and astrologies and all these crystals and candles and all this flower therapy and, and flora therapy and these and these th therapies of all kinds. Why do people get involved with that? The, the only reason people get involved with that is for plain temporary benefits. Imagine this. You probably know that you all have a because of your order, a very close relationship with India. And I'm sure probably many of you have been there. I don't know how many of you are from there. But the thing is, you know about Hinduism, you know, and you know about yoga, see? And you know, Hatha Yoga is the first yoga, the ground yoga. And on the, in the West, people are so ignorant about pagan religions and Eastern philosophies that they think Hatha Yoga is just an exercise, see? And then when you know yoga and you know there are seven yogas and Hatha Yoga is the ground yoga, you know that yoga is a worshiping, is a, is a body language worshiping to deities, gods, right? There is, there is a god for every pose of yoga, right? There is a god and it's, they have the statue for everyone. They worship them. So when they do Hatha Yoga, they are worshiping all those gods, see? And they do this for an hour, I don't know how long. So in the West, people are so ignorant about the East that they use that as exercise. And they benefit themselves because they turn like cats, right? Stressed out. I, I practiced that for 14 years in California when I was an actor, a musician. In order to be in shape, I was practicing Hatha Yoga at high degrees of temperature, sweating my life away. and. And I turned, I was so elastic, I was like a cat, right? And, and all because of Hatha Yoga, right? I had no idea I was worshipping false gods. I was worshipping deities, you know? And, and then later on, when I converted, and I, I understood what it meant, that it was an abomination for me as a Catholic to tap into false gods and worship them, you know? Then I began to talk about that, and I got all kinds of all kinds of enemies in the church. There were priests, practicing nuns, all, all kinds of Catholics, very distinguished Catholics, so they hated me. Fortunately, the church already came out with a document, you know, explaining why we should never practice it. 
and it's very simple, you know. Um, I give you an example. In the book of the Maccabees, there is a passage of Judas Maccabee. Uh, he was wondering why his soldier has lost the last war, because they were always protected by God. They will win all the battles. They will defeat the enemy always. They were all a prayerful army. They were in prayer. They were faithful Jews. They were faithful to God. And that battle they lost. So Judas was very curious about it and went to see his dead soldiers. And when he opened up their uniforms, they had amulets, amulets around their necks. So what happened is in the last war they won, they took the amulets out of the dead soldiers, they killed and put them on for good luck. See? So what the good luck they got is that God didn't bless them and then the next battle they were all killed. See, that's one of the biggest signs of the systems of purgatory that the church uses because Judas Maccabee immediately went collecting money to send to Israel, for them to Jerusalem, for them to pray for the dead, for the salvation of the dead. So that's one of the biggest shows of the existence of purgatory that was in the soul of a Jew, that was a good Jew, a, a, a holy Jew, that God was with him always. And this is an example of what an abomination is. We should never, you see, we have a very jealous God. We can never, never touch anything that comes from a foreign God. As simple as that, never. So New Age is about inviting us to join all kinds of gods and cultures and not to think much of that. We are all brothers and sisters. We all belong together. So we can hold hands and share our religions and our cultures as one. That is a lie. You know, we could never do that. You see, that's why Jesus came and said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Mother against children and this and the other. People were in awe. So how could God do that? It was very simple. If we are to obey God, a lot of people are not going to like us. See, because if I'm going to live on God's law, I have to, I necessarily going to have enemies. Necessarily. A lot of people are not going to agree with me. See, sometimes I go to funerals because I try to find my mass everywhere I go. So I go to funerals and uh, someone is there in the coffin and they bring all this, you know, presentation of the life of this person that they are burying. And then one of the relatives goes up and said, my aunt was the greatest woman. She never had problems with anybody. She got along with everyone. He was, she was so holy. And then I'm thinking inside, I say, how holy could you be when you get along with everyone? See, I mean, that, they bury in the hypocrites, right? Because you notice the holiest people in the world, your, your own founder, John Paul II. They had enemies everywhere. People that hated them, right? Because they don't like what they think about. They don't like they protect life. All the abortion movements, pro-abortion, they hate people that protect life, right? You will have enemies everywhere. When you, when you testify in behalf of God, people come against you. So how could you die without having problems with anybody and being getting along with everyone? That is an example of what New Age is about. New Age is about political correctness. See, going about being friends with everyone. Sometimes I find in the church, in the Catholic church, charismatic groups. I, I preach to a lot of them, and a lot of them are very holy and gifted, but some of them are really lost, you know. What they do is they go together with Protestants and they go into worshiping together God. And then when they are with them, they, they tell everyone, don't talk about the Virgin Mary, don't say anything about the Eucharist, don't talk about this and the other, and they close down all the gifts of the church because they are with Protestants. So we are going to hold hands and be like them. Then what they do is they turn the Catholic Church into another Christian denomination. See. That is the absolute opposite of ecumenism. You know, ecumenism is a, is, a, is a dialogue between Christian believers. But the dialogue was set up by the Second Council in order to invite all of those Christians that have been gone from the Mother Church to invite them back to the Mother Church. 
That's the real sense of ecumenism. It's not that we are to get together with all the Protestants and then be one with them and make sure we don't offend them. Let's don't talk about Mary and let's don't talk about the sacraments or nothing like that because that will scare them, see? Because that will be exactly a sign of new age. That's what new age is about. Let's all get along. Let's all of us get along. And then in spite of everything, that's why the European Union is trying to get with all the countries, you know? They are taking down all the, all the cultural idiosyncrasies, everything, and turning them into one thing. And then religion is not to be discussed publicly anywhere. No one should wear any religious garments anywhere. And they are getting to that. You know, they, in France, you know what they did? And apparently they're doing that to stop the Muslims from doing this and the other. No, what they're trying to do is to stop religion and then stop God in people's life. That's what they're doing. So it's a very subliminal force. So every door we open into the dark, becomes a window where the devil comes in and that's exactly what New Age is about. So if you want to know how free you are of New Age, you have to know how faithful you are to sacred traditions, same doctrine and church hierarchy. See, the only way to be free of New Age is if you are in line with the church, in line with the church. It's the only way you could navigate these waters without being touched by that. You know, the Hebrews that were taken into the Exodus by Moses, they were there for 430 years as a chastisement of God. And then many generations were born in Egypt. So they had, they had an Egyptian culture, they, though they had Hebrew blood. So when God took them out of Egypt and got them through the desert, one of the main lessons they had to learn, they had to exercise themselves from the Egyptian culture. And you notice that every time Moses was taking a little long, they will turn to worship, you know, all kinds of false gods, because they had that culture. They, they, they were not Egyptians, but they were born there. So that's exactly what, what we are on earth. We are in Egypt, and then God is teaching us not to worship anything of the earth, not to worship nature, not to worship any power of the earth. And then every time we go to worship self, worship money, worship any human power, worship anything of earth, then God comes in and says, this is not what you have to, and, and then that's how the spirit of, of God comes after us. This is the teaching, you know, we are to set ourselves free from idolatry. We are to set ourselves free from worshiping uh, uh, creation. You notice how sometimes we worship people and we don't even know it. Sometimes for us to be peaceful, joyful, and content in general, people have to love us. See, we have to be appreciated by others. We have to be acknowledged by others. We have to be able to control others. And then we are peaceful and sort of happy. That is idolatry, right? Because what, it, what we're doing is we're depending on people to be happy. We're depending on people to be peaceful. So we are not depending on God to be happy and peaceful. Our peace and our joy do not come from God, comes from human beings. Therefore, we are worshiping people. Therefore, we are idolaters. And then our life is like a roller coaster. Because the day they love us, we smile. When they reject us, we hate, right? We are angry. So that is idolatry. So that's why if we want to make sure how free we are from idolatry, we have to understand how much do we do depend of people to be content. See, if, if people really have so much power over you, that's how much idolatry you have in your heart. No human being should be able to take your peace away. No human being. Anytime you let a human being take your peace away, for whatever action is taking place, you have adored that person. You just worship that person. That's what it is. It's pure idolatry. So you can never give power to people. You can never give power to nature. You can only give power to God. God should be your ruler. God should be your source of joy. God should be your source of peace. 
God should be your source of contemplation where you will acknowledge your life and realize the economy of your soul that can only come from God, could not come from a human being, could not come from you. So to be free of new age, you have to make sure you are free of idolatry. And idolatry permeates us in many levels, many levels. Sometimes we are so attached to our, our, our own little habits. We have habits that we develop, and those habits become idolatry because we worship them. You know, some people have to have certain things at certain time every day. And if they don't have them, they are miserable. So it's the same thing. They are worshiping those little habits. So that's another source, another level of idolatry. The same thing. You should never be attached to anything that controls you. You should never let yourself be controlled by anything. You notice that is our animal side. You notice how a dog before laying down, sometimes they go around like a few times and then they lay down, see? We do the same, but we don't have to go around physically, but we do it mentally. You go into a place and then your mind goes around looking for the place where you're going to sit, just like the dog, going, <laughs> and then you go, you go and sit wherever, wherever your mind settles, right? And it's just, it's an animal movement, but us is, ours is more sophisticated because we have reason. So the dog doesn't have that. So the poor dog has to do it physically, going around like this. We have a mind, so we do it mentally. But we're doing faster rounds than the dog. We're going like this, really fast. And, and so if we are aware of that, then we know how easily we are attached to our habits because we are really fast. And we can be depending on many things and then those, all those things are levels of idolatry. And that's all of that is part of New Age. All of that is part of New Age. Because those are all windows of the dark. See, you notice how someone is so, so eager about everything they do and the way they do it, that if they put this book here like this, they always put it there. And someone dares to come and move it here. Then you go, like this, you are lost. You're already thinking, I know who did it, right? And you go into all kinds of sinful, you know, thoughts, and then you end up having a problem because you gave so much power to the way you put this book here that you're already worshiping this. You're already dependent on this, right? And, and that's how slavery comes in. That's how we become a slave of our natural ways. And then God is teaching us to set ourselves free from every attachment. We have to let go, completely let go of all these things. And the freedom that we find, the freedom, the more we let go, the lighter the soul, the lighter the heart, the more joy and peace, obviously, because we are not attached to these little habits and all these things that control us. And there are two monsters in our conduct, human conduct. One is wanting to control, and the other one is wanting approval. <clears throat> Those two are two monsters, two demons. See, if, if you do what you do, and you do that because you want to control, then you are outside the spirit. And if you do what you do, and all you do is because you want approval, you are outside the spirit of love. You are just ruling yourself, your little life. And that makes you a slave, that turns you into a slave. Because you are depending on being approved, or you're depending on controlling people, controlling life, controlling situations. When you're not able to control or to get approval, you are angry. You're frustrated, you are depressed, you're confused, you, everything is stuck, you don't, you, don't, you don't flow. You feel bad, you can't even get sick. So that's why we have to find our freedom and let go of those chains. That's the only way we could be free if we let go of all these little habits, all of that. And obviously, when we talk about this and the way I'm talking, you say, who is going to be saved then? You know, like the apostle said. <laughs> but the thing is, we are really working towards perfection. Imagine if we sit here to do and preach the rules of mediocrity, say, try as hard as you can. 
Try to get better. You will get better. Try, try. Don't be too hard on yourself. A lot of people say, he's so kind, has so much love and compassion, right? And they love that preaching. A lot of people love that. But when you come and speak about true perfection, how to get rid of all this evil, then a lot of people don't like it. They say, oh man, who's going to be saved? This is too much. How could we get there? Say, well, the thing is, we will never make it on our own. We know that. Never. But the thing is, God came along with Jesus to complete us. Jesus is completeness. So Jesus is redemption. Redemption means he will give us what we are missing. He will join us in the work. You know, one of the most beautiful things that the Lord taught me about myself was when I, was, I, I became a missionary. And, and I was begging the Lord to help me because I was so confused. You know how it is that the closer you get to God, the most unworthy you feel about everything. Say, why, and I'm sure all of you go through this, why, did, why was I chosen by you to be a nun and be your servant, Lord, when I'm such a miserable one, you know, such a sinner? And then same thing happens to me, I say, me, the worst one, one that persecuted you, that made fun of you and persecuted Christians, and now I am a missionary of your church, help me, have mercy on me. And then the Lord showed me this, he said, as long as you make sure that you do renounce to sin with all your heart, all your mind, all your being, even though you're not going to be able to overcome it on your own, the day you truly renounce to it, it will disappear from my presence, though you will fall back and forth into that weakness for the rest of your life. But that weakness is going to purify you because it's going to be your biggest torment. See, the more fear of God we have, the more sin torments us. It's like Saint, um, Saint Gemma of Galgani, I'm sure you probably know her. Um, she was being tempted with impurity by Satan greatly. And she suffered all night long. And then when that was gone, and Jesus appeared to her, she said, where were you all night? Look at what I've been through. And he said to her, who do you think was, was making you hate the temptation? Who do you think? I was in you getting you to hate that. And that's why you are closer to me today. And then that is the truth. You know, we have to understand that once we renounce to our weaknesses, and give them up truly doesn't mean we are overcoming them and we're never going to fall back into that and Satan is not going to trip us yes but as long as we despise them as long as we we abhor them as long as we are tormented by that weakness it doesn't appear before God at all the day we die though we had that weakness all of our life the day we die, we come before his tribunal. Before him, that weakness is gone a long time ago. Because God knew that all we wanted was to overcome that weakness. That's all we wanted. So we got it. That's mercy and compassion. That is God. God is a good God. I give you a very plain human example to that. Parallel. You have a son. And the son is going to school. He studies really hard. But he's not very bright, you know. And then the day of a very, very important exam, the father says, sees the son all night up, working hard, doing all he can. He goes to school and fails, doesn't pass the grade. Comes back home, and for that good parent, he says to the son, son, for me, you made the grade, though you didn't make it for them, but for me, don't worry, you made it because you gave everything you had. So it means to me that you made it and that should suffice you. Even if they didn't give you the grade, I give it to you. And this is God. You know, God is that. The world will punish us. You know, when we are found guilty on human law, they sent us to prison. They sent us. us. But when we are found guilty before God's tribunal, he saved us and rescued us. That's the difference between the two justices. And, and we have to understand that this is the calling of freedom. So that's why the devil is laying out 
all these incredible games that are called New Age, all these games, and they come in. You know, I have seen whole communities, religious communities go down because they let New Age come into the convents. You know, they begin with uh, enneagrams, all kinds of numerologies, all kinds of mental techniques and, and all kinds of technologies and all kinds of things that will pervert the convents, you know, and they will become so intelligent, so bright, so aware, so, so up to date that they will destroy the convent, you know, because the spirit of division comes in, pride comes in, uh, human intelligence and talents bloom the wrong direction, and all of this destroys the religious life. The prayer life goes down, see, love goes down, compassion goes down, pride comes up. So, and then the, the vocations are over, God will not bless them, and at the end, the whole community falls apart. I've seen that time and time again, you know. One time I was in Toronto, about nine years ago, and I went to this sister, to a convent, uh, for a retreat. I wasn't giving a retreat to a sister, but they rent out the place for retreats. And I went there with a group of lay people, and I gave a three days retreat on a weekend. And then as I was walking through the convent, convent grounds, I began to see all these circles of fire, crystals, uh, all kinds of symbology that from New Age. And then I talked to the nun, the Mother Superior, and I said, why are you involved with all of this? Don't you know that all of this comes from the devil? All of this is New Age. And she said, oh son, I read your story, and I know you just came into the church. You have a long way to go before you know what I know. Say, I know best. I have been a nun for 37 years in this community. That's why I'm more superior today. And all of these are gifts of God. Say, imagine that. I was going like, whoa. See, who could, I, who could talk to her? I was going, Mother, I respect what you do, but I do not agree with it, and I think it's, this is from the devil. I hope you get rid of that, because otherwise this convent is going to go down. And I said, I asked her, I said, how many new vocations do you have in the last five years? And then she was silent. She walked away. See, I realized there were only five nuns, and they had, I don't know how many people working for them, because they turned that place into a great retreat place for Muslims, for Buddhists, for all kinds of people who were going to retreats there. And then I didn't know that day that, but I found out later. So. I came back two years later to the same area, but we went to a retreat somewhere else. And I asked the, the lady that, that put together those retreats about that convent. And she said, that convent went down all the way. You know, my superior died of cancer not very soon after I was there. And then the other ones, they sold the place and each one of them had a condominium and they live independent from one another, each one on their own apartment. Yeah, that was the end of the convent, you know? So, and those things are because of the source of evil, you know? People are not aware of the great damage that this brings in because God absolutely despised that. That's, that is an abomination. There is nothing that God hates more than you bringing in anything from foreign gods. Anything that has to be with magic, divination, superstitions, natural powers, natural healings, things like that, all of that comes from the dark. And then most of it is apparently beneficial. And that word is so dangerous. It's like St. Paul says, everything is licit, but not everything is to my convenience. So we have to understand that. I'm going to ask the Lord for his word, and I'm going to read to you from Romans 12.1, Christian life, be concerned for others. I beg you, dearly beloved, by the mercy of God, to give yourselves as a living and holy sacrifice, pleasing to God, such is the worship of a rational being. Don't let yourselves be shaped by the world where you live but rather be transformed through the renewal of your mind. You must discern the will of God, what is good, what pleases, what is perfect. The grace that God has given me allows me to tell each of you 
Be active, but not indiscreet. Let each one exercise wisely the gifts of faith granted by God. See, the body is one, even if formed by many members, but not all of them with the same function. The same with us, being many, we are one body in Christ, depending on one another. Let each one of us, therefore, serve according to our different gifts. Are you a prophet? Then give the insights of faith. Let the deacon fulfill his office. Let the teacher teach. Let one who encourages convince. You must likewise give with an open hand, preside with dedication, and be cheerful in your works of charity. The word of the Lord. Amen.